Hey everybody, what's going on? Welcome to another episode of Hockey on the Spot with Brandon Barenfeld. I'm Brandon Barenfeld. Thank you for joining me. This is episode number 19 of Hockey on the Spot, continuing with the 30 teams in 30 days for the entire month of August. And for today, we are going to talk about the Detroit Red Wings. And for the Detroit Red Wings, for 32 years, they've been in the Western Conference. They've been there since 1981 back then called the Campbell Conference, um, and finally, 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 they moved to the East. They've been wanting to move to the East for a very long time, but now they move to the East and say goodbye to a lot of the great rivalries they had while in the West, um, particularly rivalries with the St. Louis Blues, Colorado Avalanche, Anaheim Ducks, Dallas Stars, and most important of all, the Chicago Blackhawks. And it was quite a fitting fashion that the Red Wings lead the Western Conference the way they did, even though they didn't win the Stanley Cup. But if they were going to get eliminated by anybody, get eliminated by the team that they've known as their arch rivals and the longest running grudge match in the National Hockey League in history, the most played out match in NHL history, the Chicago Blackhawks and the Detroit Red Wings. Um, and how they got that far, very interesting. For it, they had a very rough start to the season, and they were very inconsistent all year long. <clears throat> Their offense was surprisingly not that great, um, 19th in the league, and they finished in a position that they weren't familiar with, 7th in the West, but they basically clinched that spot on the last day of the season, which is not uh, Detroit Red Wings-like. And a lot of that really had to do with the retirement of Nicholas Lidstrom uh, last off season. A lot of people predicted that they were going to struggle without him, and they were right. However, they had a very strong performance at the end of the season, and when it came down to them, the Columbus Blue Jackets and the Minnesota Wild both they and the Minnesota Wild would make the playoffs. The Columbus Blue Jackets would not. So the Red Wings would finish the season with 56 points um, and a strong record, actually, in 48 games, 24, 16, and 8. Um, yeah, 56 points. Um, and, and um, but yeah, and in the overall league, they finished 13th. 13th in the overall league, um, so great for them. And they have an unbelievable playoff run. What they were not able to do in the regular season, they were able to do in the playoffs. Even though it was a second-round elimination, it was still a great playoff run. They went up against the Anaheim Ducks, the third-best team in the Nash during the regular season in the overall league and the Pacific Division winners. A team that basically came out of nowhere. They took out the Anaheim Ducks in Anaheim in Game 7. Seven-game series. Great series, too. Um, and then they had a stranglehold on the eventual champion Chicago Blackhawks. They had a 3-1 series lead. Chicago would win the first game. Detroit would then win the next three. But then, unfortunately for the Wings, the Blackhawks came back, took it to Game 7. The Red Wings fought back to tie it up in Game 7, but... Unfortunately for them, it would be defenseman Brent Seabrook who would end their season in OT. Um, so, very disappointing way to go out for the Red Wings. But if you really look at it, a great way to leave a conference where you developed so many rivalries. So, now they go on to the Eastern Conference in a new Atlantic division. Um, the Florida Panthers and the Tampa Bay Lightning are going to be there as well. But those three teams going into a division that already included the Boston Bruins, Buffalo Sabres, Montreal Canadiens, Ottawa Senators, and Toronto Maple Leafs. And for the Boston Bruins, Montreal Canadiens, and Toronto Maple Leafs, three original six teams, making the new Atlantic division the oldest division in the National Hockey League as far as team standards go. Four original six. Unbelievable. So, the big... So, now with an... Now, the Detroit Red Wings have lighter travel time for a team that usually plays their games at around 7, 7.30 um, p.m. Eastern time. 
They no longer have to go over and make constant trips to California or Northwest Canada, um, so uh, or Colorado for that matter. So think traveling is going to be a lot easier for them. However, the teams that they will be going up against, is that going to be easy for them? Well, they did make some off-season moves <clears throat> to try and help themselves out a little bit. It, um, they have a bunch of guys that are no longer going to be Red Wings this year. Um, forward, two of them who they actually wanted to bring back, uh, right winger Damian Brunner, who played as a rookie, 27 year old rookie last year, native out of Switzerland, played very well for them. He rejected two, their two initial offers. He did not get the offer he was looking for. And so the Red Wings decided to give up on him. And they also wanted to bring back veteran left winger, Dan Cleary. But unfortunately, the Red Wings are slightly over the cap right now and cannot afford to bring him back. So now Cleary's going to either have to retire or go find work elsewhere. Um, but they also have a couple other guys um, from their lineup that uh, will not be back. Ian White, a defenseman, he will not be back. And uh, Slovenian forward Jan Mersak. He also is still an unrestricted free agent, but because they're over the cap, he will not be back. And then they also have some prospects on that still unrestricted free agents that all will not be back. Daniel Larson, uh, Francis Pear, Jordan Pierce, and Brent Radke, Radiki, or whatever. Um, um, and then they also have Carlo Koliakovo on that unrestricted free agent list, too, defenseman. Um, he had another year remaining on his contract. They bought out the last year of his contract. He did not live up to expectations, only played six games last year, was out for most of the year because of injuries, um, a defenseman who just was never able to stay healthy. Um, he is still yet to sign with another team, but that's going to be the most likely destination for him. The only subtraction of theirs that has actually gone to another team so far Probably their biggest loss this offseason, Valtteri Filppula, who was a, both a center and a left winger, but played mostly center last year, was one of the best in the league at face-off win percentage, and also is a consistent player when it comes to putting up solid numbers, 40 to 50 points score each and every year. But he is now he is gone. He signs over with Steve Eiserman and the Tampa Bay Lightning. They'll be seeing a lot of the Tampa Bay Lightning this year, though, because they're now in the same division, which means they'll be seeing a lot of Stevie Y and Val Filpola. So, um, good addition for the Lightning. But, they, again, with what the Red Wings bought in, they could not afford to bring back... Um, they could not afford to bring back Val Terry Filpola. And they actually made some pretty good signings, too, to replace Valtteri Filppula and to maybe arguably upgrade from that at the center position. They bring in uh, centerman Steven Weiss coming over from the Florida Panthers. He had been the longest 10-year Florida Panther in franchise history um, and up until last year had been a pro consistent scorer. But last year, his season was cut short due to injuries and he only had uh, about four points. Um, he only had four points in 17 games. So even when he was healthy, he did not really have a great year. Um, so it was a shameful season for Weiss in many ways and the Florida Panthers team in general. But Weiss coming over to Detroit, signing a long year, signing a five-year deal. He's locked up for a while. Um, and I think it's a good move for the Red Wings. That gives them an actual second-line center. And a guy who can bring more versatility to their forward group. So it allows them to do a lot more with their forwards. And then the big signing for the Detroit Red Wings, even though it was only to a one-year deal, the signing that shocked the hockey world, Daniel Alfredson, the longtime captain of the Ottawa Senators, a guy who was expected to be a senator for his entire career, at the last minute decides to leave Ottawa and sign a one-year deal with the Detroit Red Wings. Uh, 39 in our so a big shocking move for the Nate for the Swede to come over um, in an, a move that really shocked the world he is now 40 years of age um, um, and this is basically 
in his 18-year career. He leaves Ottawa, basically, in hopes that he'll fulfill his dream to win the Stanley Cup. Um, but at the same time, you got to figure that this will probably be his last year in the National Hockey League, um, unless he does, unless he stays in as long as Teemu Solani do, did and plays for another three or four years. But that's highly unlikely. But anyway, I like this move, too, though it gives the Red Wings another player to work with. Kind of like similar to the Marion Hossa experiment from a few years back. Um, not as good as Marion Hossa, obviously. Never really was as good as Marion Hossa, but <laughs> still a good player. And even at his 40 years of age, he can still play the game. He really can. He bled, brought the Senators deep into the playoffs and led a team that was basically injured most of the year. Um, so it tells you about his leadership qualities. He'll most likely be an alternate captain in uh, Detroit this year with Henrik Zetterberg as the actual captain. Um, but it's a good move for Detroit. It really is. Um, and then they also made some re-signings as well. Um, but again, the additions of Weiss and Alfredson also help out their power play. And Weiss will help out their penalty kill too. But... They also made a couple re-signings. They get Pavel Datsuk signed up to a three-year contract extension. They get Gustav Nyquist signed. They get Joachim Anderson signed. Both of those guys are basically regulars in the lineup now. Um, they all And the big signing, they get their goaltender, Jimmy Howard, signed up to a six-year deal. They get him locked up long-term. Um... But now, again, because of all these re-signings, they are now over the cap by a little bit, and they now need to make some trades. They've been looking to possibly trade veterans Todd Bertuzzi and Michael Samuelson, um, but nothing has worked as of right now. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> it's going to be very interesting to see it in Detroit. Now, which leads us to a couple of questions. Are the additions of Weiss and Alfredson going to actually make their offense better? Um, <clears throat> how is their young defense going to hold up this year? And are the Detroit Red Wings uh, prepped up to make their 23rd consecutive playoff appearance? That last question remains to be seen. But as far as the other two go, <laughs> um, I think this does boost up their offense a little bit. Um, Alfredson, again, at 40 years old, can still play. He's a good offensive player. Weiss is a good producer as well. Maybe a little overrated at times, but again, I like, I like their forward core. I really do. Um, their lines, I think, look really good. Um, um, Pavel Datsuk and Henrik Zetterberg probably will play on the same line to start the year, and they'll probably have Justin Abdelkader up on that top line. A lot of people maybe would think Johan Franzen would play up there, but they like Justin Abdelkader and the chemistry he had in the playoffs last year with those two, so he'll most likely be on that line. Steven Weiss and Danny Alfredson will most likely play on the same line, and they have some possible candidates to play on the wing with them, like Gustav Nyquist is probably the top candidate, but my opinion, I think in the end, Johan Franzen will be their line mate because of the fact that... Um, the Detroit Red Wings now have will have all three of their best players from the Grand Rapids Griffins up this year. With Damian Brunner gone, this will finally be the time for Thomas Tatar to step in and make a full-time play in the NHL full-time. It's definitely his time to do so. And back a, 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 with the back with the Grand Rapids Griffins. That line, up top line of Joachim Anderson, Thomas Tatar, and Gustav Nyquist was the best line in the American Hockey League, and one of the very reasons why they won their first ever Calder Cup this year before Gustav Nyquist got, got called up, and then Joachim Anderson. When those two got called up, and even when they got called up, Thomas Tatar basically filled in their position, and he did great, you know. that's That, to me, that kid line should be their third line. Joachim Anderson at center with Thomas Tatar and Gustav Nyquist on the wing. And then for their fourth line, Darren Helm is back, folks. He 
only played one game last year before suffering a season-ending injury, but he's going to be back this year, and they need him. They need him. His speed is going to be a big asset to this team. He'll most likely play with Drew Miller, and whoever the wing is, whether it's Todd Bertuzzi, if he's still there, Michael Samuelson, if he's still there, or Jordan Tutu, if he's still there. And then, of course, their young defense. To me, their defense looks a little mediocre. Nicholas Coronwell, Jonathan Erickson, Jakob Kindle, Kyle Quincy, Brendan Smith, Brian Lash off their seventh guy, and then Danny DeKaiser. He'll be back from his injury that he suffered in Game 2 against the Anaheim Ducks. He's going to be a huge contributor. And then for the goaltenders, Jimmy Howard, without question, is the starter. But they'll have a battle for the backup spot. Jonas Gustafsson is the projected backup right now. However, their top prospect, Peter Mrazik, um, could battle for that spot as well. He's expected to be very good. Speaking of which, let us take a look at the Red Wings' top prospects. Again, Peter Mrazik is their top prospect. Um, Callie Jarncroc on there. This is a solid prospect pool, in my opinion. Maybe not as deep as the Boston Bruins or the Buffalo Sabres, but it's still solid enough. Um, they also got Anthony Mantha on there, the only draft drafted player this year to score 50 goals, playing for the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League, a big 6'4 player. However, the prospect on this list that really highlights my world is their number four prospect, right winger, Thomas Yurko, native out of Slovakia. Um, second round pick, number 35th overall, 2011 NHL entry draft by the Detroit Red Wings. This guy is an absolute magician. Very famous for his puck handling skills. Has great puck handling skills. This guy is going to be something special. Um, he may not always put up the greatest offensive numbers, but it's his puck skills alone that makes him a top prospect. Very famous for his videos on YouTube. Um with those puck skills. He's definitely could get promoted to the NHL level at some point during the season. It wouldn't surprise me, and it would be great to see him, because let me tell you something, folks. The NHL is going to have a really exciting player to watch when this kid gets called up. He's going to be a star. Now, for the Detroit Red Wings to be successful this season, the player on this team that needs to play well this year in order for them to be, be a playoff team this year no question whatsoever, has to be Stephen Weiss. Why I say Stephen Weiss, again, it, he only played 17 games last year, mo an injury season, and he only had four points. He was not good last year, even when he was healthy. Um, so the Red Wings bring him in, sign him to that five-year deal, hoping that he'll be a solid second-line center, and he needs to live up to that. You know what? He needs to live up to that contract. If he can do that, then they'll be fine. If he can't, then the Red Wings are going to have a lot of problems. So, to me, this a lot of this 2013-2014 season really does fall on the shoulders of Steven Weiss. If or they're going to be good this year, he has to be prove to be the signing they think he's going to be. Overall, are the Detroit Red Wings a playoff team? Are they prepped up to make their 23rd consecutive playoff appearance? Well, if they were still in the West, I'd be saying yes. But honestly, just because of the teams that are in the division with them and are in the Eastern Conference, I'm actually, believe it or not, going to say no. Most people would say yes, but I'm going to say no. First of all, I think their defense is way too young. It's going to be a development year for the, most of their defensemen, particularly Danny DeKaiser and Brendan Smith. And you never know what could happen to Jakob Kindle. He could suffer a little bit of a slump. Um, and, you know, you look at some of the other teams in the East, the Boston Bruins, the Montreal Canadiens, a growing Toronto Maple Leafs team that now has Jonathan Bernier, a growing Ottawa Senators team with a great goalie in Craig Anderson, the New York Rangers, Pittsburgh Penguins, Washington Capitals. You look at all these teams, their rosters to me look a lot better than the Red Wings roster, and so that is why I'm going to say no to their play. I think their their playoff streak is going to come to an end this year. All right, guys, I'll do for episode 18 of Hockey on the Spot. Join me again tomorrow when I talk about the Florida Panthers. So until then, this has been Hockey on the Spot with Brandon Barenfeld. I'm Brandon Barenfeld, and tune in next time. See you guys tomorrow. Have a great day.